have a long story, but... Welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking to my lifelong friend, Alex. Okay, let's back up. Prosthetics were created long before cyborgs and modern robotics. In fact, the first prosthetic in ancient history is mentioned in the Egyptian myth of Osiris. Osiris, the god of fertility and the reigning king, was killed by his brother Set, the god of chaos, trickery, and fire, among other things. Horus, Osiris' son, is warned by his mother Isis to protect the people of Egypt from Set. Set contests Horus' right to the throne. This binds Set as Horus' sworn enemy, and the two battle, frequently, to avenge his father and protect Egypt. During one battle, Set gouges Horus' eye. Despite losing the eye, Horus defeats Set, avenging his father and assuming the throne. His left eye, still damaged, is then restored by Thoth, the god of wisdom, writing, science, magic, judgment, and art. When Horus's eye is recovered, he offers it to his father, Osiris, now the god of the dead and afterlife. In offering his eye to his father, in the hopes of restoring his father's life, his eye is recovered. The restoration of Horus's eye by Thoth is the first mention of any sort of prosthetic. Though archaeological evidence has been found from around 3000 to 2800 BCE in ancient Iran, an eye prosthesis was found on a woman in Shari Sukte. It was likely constructed of bitumen paste, a naturally occurring mixture of hydrocarbons, and then covered in a layer of thin gold. Other examples can be found in Egypt, South Asia, and Greek and Roman histories. A body in Egypt was found with a wooden toe, dated to 1000 BCE. In South Asia, around 1200 BCE, the warrior queen Vishpala was recorded in Reg Veda as having a leg amputated, and after the healing of the wound, an iron leg fitted so she could return to battle. Greek historian Herodotus documented the story of Hegesistratus a Greek diviner working for Medonius during the Greco-Persian Wars. He was captured by Spartans and put in bonds, but escaped by cutting off his own foot, which was later replaced with a wooden one. Pliny the Elder recorded the tale of Roman general Marcus Sergius, a Roman general who had his right hand cut off while campaigning. An iron hand was made to hold his shield and return to battle, much like the story of Ishpala. Though the first confirmed use of a prosthetic was discovered in 2000, when a researcher found a mummy with an artificial toe, which showed signs of use. The mummy dated between 950 and 710 BCE and was found in an Egyptian necropolis near ancient Thebes. In 2011, biomechanical testing discovered that the toe would have enabled the wearer to walk both barefoot and with sandals. Prior to this discovery of the Egyptian toe, the Capra leg had been believed to be the oldest artificial limb. Discovered in Capra, Italy, the leg was dated to 300 BCE. Unfortunately, it was destroyed in an air raid during World War II. There are many historic characters who have been noted to have had prosthetic limbs, and it was not uncommon for injured knights to be fitted with prosthetics to hold the shield, lance, sword, or to stabilize mounted soldiers. One early prosthetic worth mentioning belonged to an Italian man whose right hand was amputated and replaced with a knife. He'd been estimated to have lived between the 6th and 8th centuries, and materials found with his body suggest it was attached with a leather strap that he tightened with his teeth. Though it was during the Renaissance that prosthetics were beginning to be developed with iron, steel, copper, and wood more frequently. 
and functioning prosthetics emerged in the 1500s. Before the 20th century, there was little done with prosthetics outside of battle. One Italian surgeon recorded the existence of an amputee with an arm that allowed him to remove his hat, open a purse, and sign his name. All of these examples remain scattered and without real promise of benefiting the lives of amputees long term. Modern improvements include Ambrose Pear's above the knee device with a knee locking control, Pierre de Verdin's first non locking below knee prosthetic, and the cell phone leg created by James Potts, which is a leg that articulated at both the knee and the ankle, connected with cat gut tendons, which was later improved on by Benjamin Palmer who added springs and concealed the tendons for a more natural look. These advancements were useful, but it was an investment following World War II that allowed for foundational developments in prosthetics that we see today. Research and development in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Veterans Association allowed for developments by James Fort and C.W. Radcliffe to create a quadrilateral socket. As technology continued to advance, the introduction of microprocessor-controlled prosthetics in the early 90s and adaptive prosthetics in 1998, which include hydraulic controls, pneumatic controls, and a microprocessor to provide responsiveness to walking speed, are all foundational leaps toward the cyborgs that Alex mentioned.
but it can't all just be cyborg development. So what does the processes do every day?
why prosthetics? What made you want to do prosthetics or how did you even come to know that that was a thing that you could do? So back to the robotics and cyborgs. So how does that work with those sensors? Is there like a connection to your brain? Is it is it like brain surgery where things are then connecting to the things that are in your, your prosthetic arm so that you can interpret those senses? So using a computer that we as humans build and understand how it functions, 
bypassing our own internal computer that is the brain that is still this amorphous, not completely understood organ to make sure that these nerves are functioning so that you can get a sense of not only like what you're touching, but also potentially getting responses from that. probably also safer to not poke around in people's brains and to kind of just play around with what little nerve responses will be. <laughs> So you've talked about what the capabilities are now, but where do you see prosthetics headed in the future? So 3D printing organic materials that can be incorporated with robotics so that you can have a naturally composed limb that is robotically controlled. If we were capable of 3D printing the organic actual limb and using robotics to help make sure that it functions as the limb did prior to it becoming a prosthetic, is that something that would need to be replaced the same way other prosthetics have to be replaced?
And I'm sure insurance likely doesn't cover these cutting edge, top of the line kind of prosthetics, right? It takes a, a prosthetist to really advocate for a patient to be able to get the kind of prosthetic that they need, in most cases for insurance. Self-advocation is really what it would take for you to be able to get your doctors all on the same page to prove to insurance that you need to replace the limb that you've lost.
I just want validation in making sure that I understand this correctly. Ultimately, it's not science or innovation that's holding us back from having robotic limbs. Just listen to the dentists. So it's not technology that's holding us back from huge medical advancement, but a cumbersome system that lays burden on the individual. But the work that Alex and other healthcare professionals do each day brings us closer to ensuring amputees can do all the things they did before. Thank you for listening. I appreciate your support on this new project, and I love to hear from y'all. So reach out on social media or email me at longstorypod at gmail.com. This podcast should be available on the listening platform of your choice. And if it isn't, let me know. Head over to that platform, rate, review, and subscribe. It really does help. Again, I'm truly grateful for your support. Until next time.